Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Emmanuel Baptist Church. Uh, let's have you stand and we'll uh, start with some singing.
keep my eyes above the waves My soul will rest in your embrace I am yours You are mine Brad has some announcements for us. Good morning. Welcome to Emmanuel Baptist Church. Is this on? Can you guys hear me? Excellent. Um, if you would like to look around and make eye contact with someone that you haven't seen yet today, wave at them, say good morning in lieu of the typical handshake greeting, uh, just so we can kind of connect a little bit and say good morning. That'd be wonderful. If I could direct your attention to the bulletin, but before that, I want to make one announcement about ladies, uh, the ladies' meeting tomorrow night. Um, that meeting will be starting at 6 o'clock. The ladies are going to be gathering together to watch the movie The Life of Esther, and everyone is welcome. Uh, ladies, I was going to say that. If you're, uh, if you're a woman, lady, girl, and you've not been attending the Bible study, but you still like to watch the movie tomorrow night, you are very invited. They would love to have you. That's going to go from 6 until the movie is over. Again, that's the life of Esther, kind of wrapping up the study they've been doing for these last, uh, this last quarter or so. Also, I'd like to draw your attention to the starving insert in the bulletin. That is a, uh, a focused 21-day pursuit of leaning into Jesus where we are. That's going to be starting on April the 11th, like it says on that insert, which means that next week we need to get you your books, which means that today is the last day for you to sign up for those. We're going to order those um, and then be handing them out next week so that you have them in advance to look through them. This is a 21-day focused, intense uh, walking with Jesus path that's going to it's very flexible. Don't hear starving and fasting and, and all these things and think, oh, well, I can't, I can't do that. It is a very flexible uh, process that is inclusive. But as a church body, this is a wonderful time, I think, for us to really get closer and lean into Jesus. Uh, if you are a couple and you want to share a book, you can make that happen, but I encourage you to, to get a book for each of you just because there's some notes and some journal areas that you're going to want to keep uh, on your own. But you, you can make it happen. But if you do that, if there's two of you and you want two books, make sure on the sign-up sheet that you indicate that. Um, I know that one couple has said they signed up together, but they're only going to do one book. Just clarify on there. Even if you've already signed up, let us know if you want just one or two books. So that's in there. Um... This week, we've got the tear-off sheet on your bulletin. If you have a prayer request, a specific need, you're a visitor or a guest, and you just want to let us know how to get a hold of you, just tear that off and put that in the offering box, which I will also make note of. The offering box is right outside the door, right here on the foyer. It says offering right on it. Um, we don't pass the plate at this time, so please take full advantage of, uh, of that to make your prayer requests known. And if you have a gift or a tithe or an offering, it goes in that box as well. There's some other things in the bulletin. Uh, children's Church still needs volunteers. VBS signups are also at the Welcome Center. Um, and one of the best things in here is that with God, nothing shall be impossible. That is a truth from Scripture. Uh, I'd like to call Darren up to pray at this time. Thanks, Brad. Let's pray. Father, we're thankful um, to be in your house this morning. We're thankful for each one here. And Lord, um, we come because we want to bring our sacrifice of praise to you this morning. Um, so we pray that you would accept that. We also want to receive from you, Lord. And uh, I know there's, there's many prayer concerns listed in the, in the bulletin. Um, those for health needs, uh, Lord, for, for financial needs, um, just for for people struggling hard times. Um, I just pray, Lord, that you would meet every need that's expressed there. And um, 
Father, be, be real to those who, who put their trust in you. And uh, so that's my prayer, Lord. Be with us now, we pray, as uh, we continue with the service. Uh, hear, hear our praises and receive those. And Lord, um, just also speak to us from your word this morning, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Darren. Go ahead and have, uh, have you all stand, and we'll continue with some singing. With the right song. Yeah. 
creation There at the start Before the beginning of time With no point of reference He spoke to the dark And fleshed out the wonder of life And as you speak A hundred billion galaxies are born In the vapor of your breath the planets form If the stars were made to worship so will I I can see your heart in every burning star, a signal fire of grace. Creation sings your praises, so will I. So will I If the mountains bow in reverence So will I If the oceans roar your greatness So will I Or if everything is as to live too high So will I If the wind goes where you send it So will I As you speak, hundred billion failures disappear. You lost your life so I could find it here. If you left the grave behind you, so will I. I can see your heart in every. Every part is a work of art called love. If you gladly chose surrender, so will I. You can see your heart in 
billion different ways Every precious one A child you died to save If you gave your life to love them So will I Like you would again A hundred billion times But what measure could Amount to your desire You're the one who never leaves the one behind Yeah.
Have a seat. Good morning, welcome. Good morning, welcome. Uh, the last song that lead me in your love to those around me. An earlier <coughs> song said, if you gave your life so that others may live, so shall I. Oh, it's convicting. You gave your life so that others may live, so shall I. Lead me in your love to those around me. Uh, that really is what much of the Christian life is all about. To be the hands and feet of God. To be instruments of his, his grace, his mercy, his love, his power. Uh, to those around us. Uh, we're going to be in the latter part of Revelation 3 today. Um, but uh, let me say a couple words about this coming week first um, and leading up toward Easter. Um, I've really failed to lay that out previously. And, and um, it's not in the bulletin, um, but we, we will be gathering here um, on what is commonly referred to as Good Friday. Um, really the, the uh, getting sort of into the, the, the guts of Passover. Um, and I think really Passover uh, is a more biblical expression of Good Friday. Um, and we're not going to do a formal Passover this year. Um, but I would direct you to, um, to our YouTube channel. Uh, Last year, I did a four-part uh, Passover teaching uh, from my home, uh, and it's in th four 30-minute segments around each of the four cups of Passover. So you can, normally it's all done in one night, one evening, um, and that would be two hours. Typically when we gather, it's about three hours because there's a meal and there's just more when you're interacting. Those teachings come to about two hours. Um, and uh, Emmanuel Baptist Church Coquille on the YouTube channel and, and, and participate there if you like. But what we are going to do is we're going to kind of boil that down to something under an hour um, and on, on Friday, on this Friday evening now it will be a bit before sunset only about 30 minutes we'll meet from 6 30 to to no later than 7 30 sunsets right around 7 um, and we'll celebrate that good friday passover together this week um, let's pray as we go forward and look into god's word the seven of the seven churches the seventh of the seven churches father in heaven lord god as we look into your word, we pray, Lord, that you would speak, that your word would speak, uh, that as you exhort us in these seven times to hear uh, what you have to say to us and that we would listen. Uh, so we commit it to you in Jesus' name. Amen. So in the book of Revelation, the letter to the seven churches, which is chapters 2 and 3, it's the now of Revelation. 
Uh, beginning in chapter 4, we get into the future, even though those things really don't begin to unfold until chapter 6. 4 and 5 is really just a scene in heaven of the worship of the Lamb of God who was slain um, and who rose again, right? And so, uh, right with where we are at this time. Uh, on our map, we see that, you know, it, he's, he's on that island of Patmos, the dot out there in the Blue Sea. He's traveled across to Ephesus and north to Smyrna and Pergamum and then swung southeast to Thyatira and then sort of basically south toward uh, Sardis, Philadelphia, um, and now to Laodicea. And what I would again encourage us to take note of is, is that in each of these seven brief letters or words oracles to these seven churches Jesus they each end with he who has an ear let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches and so I exhort us all to listen question really is is are you listening am I listening are we listening so first of all the destination Laodicea it was a wealthy city um, it, was, it was located on the road to Colossae major town of the day. It's about 40 miles southeast of Philadelphia. About 35 years before this letter was written, they had suffered a, a powerful earthquake, destroying much of the city, and they had rebuilt over that time. They had the, they had the wealth, see, as this, as this letter will indicate as well, they had the wealth to do that, to rebuild. Um, its main industry was producing a fine woolen fabric that ties in later as well um, in addressing the church let's read through the passage uh, and take it all in in one uh, and uh, then we'll we'll walk through it it's chapter 3 verse 14 to the angel or the messenger of the church in Laodicea write the amen the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God, says this. I know your deeds, that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish that you were cold or hot. So because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. Because you say I am rich, and have become wealthy and have need of nothing and do not know that you are wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. I advise you then to buy from me gold refined by fire so that you may become rich and white garments so that you may clothe yourself, that, you, that the shame of your nakedness will not be revealed. And I salve to anoint your eyes so that you may see. Those whom I love, I reprove and discipline. Therefore be zealous and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and I will dine with him and he with me. He who overcomes, I will grant to him to sit down with me on my throne. As I also overcame and sat down on my with my father on his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. So, he addresses himself to this church as the amen, the faithful and the true witness, the ruler of God's creation. The word amen means, you know, so be it. You know, it's kind of a yes, Lord. May it be so. And it refers to the sovereignty that, that God has behind humans and human events. Kind of what is embedded within his name, Yahweh. The one who is, the one who always has been, and, in, and also coming out of that name, Yahweh is 
not only is, 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 has he done it all, but he causes all things to be. And then he speaks also, reveals himself as the ruler of God's creation. And Christ existed before creation and is sovereign over it. If you turn the page, or maybe even same page, chapter 4, verse 11, where there is worship in heaven, it's, they, they cry out saying, the 24 elders, verse 11, Worthy are you, O Lord, and our God, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things, and because of, you, your, and because of your will, they existed and were created. This is the worship of Jesus, the Son, to whom it is ascribed to be creator. So he cannot, therefore, have been created. All things were created by him. He is one with God, pre-existent. Also, in uh, Colossians <clears throat> chapter 1 and verses 15 to 17, listen to this. Again, here again, speaking to the second person of the Trinity, to Jesus, the Son of God and God the Son, he says, He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. And that's interesting, isn't it? But the fact that where he is the firstborn of all creation is that he was the first that was raised from the dead. And he is the first fruits, which is really a lot of what Easter is. It's another title for Easter, and a better one, among others, is, is first fruits. He was risen from the dead. He is first. For by him all things were created both in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. Okay. So even though we, he's, he is here and elsewhere spoken of as the firstborn of creation, that, that, that cannot indicate that he himself was created. He's the firstborn of creation of that which when he took on human flesh and then was the first to raise from the dead as the first fruits and as a promise of those to raise from the dead following by faith in him. So because here it is described in, 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 in clear and powerful terms, all things were created by him, by Jesus, in heaven and on earth. And it ends with he is before all things and in him all things hold together. So not only does he create it, but you know, when we, talk, we sung about the, 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 the what was it, the, thousands, the hundreds of billions of stars and galaxies, right? I mean, it's, it's mind-boggling. We have no idea the billions and trillions of, of galaxies, let alone stars. It, it literally is impossible to take in. We kind of go into tilt mode if you try. But not only all of that was created by him, by the word of his mouth, by his will, his ongoing conscious will, it all holds together he has it like he's holding it in perfect balance because if you change a few things you know you spin earth on its axis and everything changes millions of people die hot becomes cold cold becomes hot and all manner of different things you change other scenarios of the relationship between the earth and the moon and particularly the sun and it all falls apart everything is in perfect balance the centrifugal force of the planets going around the sun are in perfect balance with the gravity which pulls them in. It's, 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 it's spectacular. It's wonderful. And he is the, the creator, the creator God. And I think this, this description in verse 1 is the setup for the rebuke. And the rebuke starts right away in verse 15. The amen, or excuse me, I know your deeds. You see, he has said that before. And sometimes I know your deeds and, you know, I have this against you. Or like with Philadelphia, I know your deeds and you're doing awesome. Here again, I know your deeds, that you are neither hot nor cold. I wish that you were hot or cold. So because you were lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. The church at Laodicea, 
Remember we said that there were two churches, Smyrna and Philadelphia, that didn't receive a rebuke. They were healthy, vital churches, much of because of suffering and responding well to persecution, to testing and refining. Here, in Laodicea, they received no commendation. Not to be confused with condemnation. They kind of really receive a bit of that. But they receive no commendation. He, he, he says through this, there's, there's no, you know, you're doing this okay, but, because he usually likes to start with, you know, you're doing okay in something but this, but there's nothing for him to even go to here. There's no commendation. It starts right in to his rebuke. What's pictured here is utterly repulsive to Christ. And he speaks of the fact is the lukewarm would spit them out of their mouth. It's disturbing to read about. Now, one of the things in which I think, you know, he's drawing on with this lukewarm thing is, is it much like now, but also then, in, in, in their feasts, as well as their religious events, people in the ancient world customarily drank either hot beverages or cold beverages, never lukewarm. And here it would have been specifically meaningful because they got their water supply from a neighboring town, Hierapolis, which was several miles away. And it started out cold, and by the time it got to Laodicea, it was lukewarm, the common drinking water for the town of Laodicea. Now, same as today, man. You know, very few people like lukewarm things, and, and, and very few beverages are really best at lukewarm. Now, a lot of times this is taught simply as, you know, I wish to, you know, be, be on fire for Jesus. But, but that's, and that's true, okay, but, but it isn't, the cold's not bad here. It isn't like, I wish you were hot. I wish that you were hot or cold. Don't be lukewarm, which is really not helpful at all. Now, sometimes I drink lukewarm beverages. I don't care. When, when, I'm, when I'm comfortable, but you know, when I'm cold and really, really cold, it is wonderful to drink a really hot you know, cup of coffee or tea or some other hot beverage. It serves a purpose. It warms me up. Or if I'm really hot, you know, you've been out in, you know, in your yard or whatever it is you're doing and you've been working really hard and you are sweating and you are thirsty and you are really warm. Wow, something cold serves a purpose. Something cold, not only it feels good, it tastes good, but it serves a purpose. It literally cools down the core of my body, which is healthy for me. Okay? So what he is saying is, is not just be, you know, on fire for Jesus, but, you know, be, be, you know, ice cold for Jesus in the sense of, of serving a, a, a purpose, something of value, something that makes a difference in somebody's life. Where Jesus talks about when you give somebody a glass of cold water in my name, you know, you serve me too. That's cold and that is refreshing. And so it really comes down to, man, he, he is saying profoundly right here, I wish that you were cold or hot, but you are lukewarm. And man, I'm telling you, you know, these seven, these letters to the seven churches, they were, they, 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 these were real churches at the time, okay? So these folks in Laodicea were alive when they, they first got this letter, and it specifically was true of them, okay? What we have today are seven letters that are applicable to the, any church at any time in any place. And lukewarm, sadly, I believe, fits far too many of us. 
far too many of our churches, far too many of the people of God. I look at my own life and I say to myself, wow, how much more on fire or how much more, you know, just, just blazing ice cold for Jesus that I could be. That's why even I was challenged from that the song that we sung, that you gave your life that others may live, so will I, the writer says. Really? Or am I comfortable? I wish that you were hot or cold. So when it comes to to life in Christ, there is, you know, sitting on the fence is strictly prohibited. It's usually quite uncomfortable as well. It's funny that, you know, lukewarm and sitting on the fence is usually a comfortable place, but I doubt it really is. And it isn't for us, is it? When we are in a lukewarm condition, we're sitting on the fence. We are not comfortable because we've always got the still small voice of the Holy Spirit that's convicting us, the Word of God in various things and people and watching the activities and, and, and the service and love of other people. And, 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 and it, it, it convicts us. And if it doesn't, there's even more to worry about. Their being lukewarm was evidenced by their being content with their material wealth and they're being unaware of their spiritual poverty. Look again at verse 17. Right on, this, this is the same breath and context of the lukewarm and I will spit you out of my mouth. Now to spit you out of my mouth, we haven't re referenced that yet. Again, I think that, that points to the fact that if I'm really cold and I want something nice and hot and it is just tepid, lukewarm, it's like, that's yuck. Or if I'm really, really hot and I want something wonderfully cold and I get this warm whatever, you know, and it's like, yuck. Um, and Jesus saying, I mean, to have Almighty God speak to a group of people and say that your, your life as you live it out, even in my name and supposedly in and, and as the church is so repulsive, I would spit you out of my mouth. Wow. That would be painful. It remains painful wherever it is true. I will spit you out of my mouth. Then verse 17, because you say I'm rich and have become wealthy. Look at this. And I have need of nothing. See? There's one thing, he, there's nothing against being rich and wealthy, though he, Scripture says it's difficult to be rich and wealthy and also a, a, a humble, submitted servant of God. It's just true. But they're rich and wealthy and boast in that, I, I got it, man. I got all I need. I have no need of others. I, I don't have need of anything. That's right, exactly what it says. And I have need of nothing. Arrogant, self-sufficient, independent, uh, rebellious to the realities of, you know, may I love others, serve others, as Jesus, Jesus says, you died, they may live, I will too. I have need of nothing, they say. He says, because of that, you say these things, and yet they are pitifully needy. Okay? They are pitifully needy. It's as if they're, you know, they, they are... They are absolutely blind, as it later says, and they have this false reality. I'm wealthy. Obviously, they would say, you know, I have, I have good eyesight, you know, because I, I have access to medical care. And they did right there in their town. And 
uh, I, I'm well clothed and, and I'm warm and I, all these things is great and I, I've got it look at me and it's as if they they just have this completely distorted view of reality God wants to put on spiritual glasses to be able to see through sort of an, an, a, a, an x-ray vision to see what is true and lies behind what they think and how they feel and their boast and their arrogance in what is true. You say, I'm rich and have, nothing, have become wealthy and have need of nothing, and you do not know that you are. So he's going to speak of what is true. You don't even know what is true of you. You do not know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. Yikes. He uses strong language to describe them. And of course, it's Jesus. He is speaking the pure, unadulterated truth. They are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. Wow. And then because of that, verses 18 and 19, he has some advice for them. Now, his advice is, is, we really say God's not giving us advice, he's giving us commands, but it's phrased in that way, I advise you. You know, he's saying it would be wise for you, this is what you really need to do. Hear, listen, obey, here's what you need to do, you need to buy from me, from, God, from, from Almighty God, refined gold, so we know it's not actual, he's not saying, hey, with all your wealth, you know, put it all into gold. Okay, so nobody go run out there and buy gold futures and, you know, that's not God's advice. Is God's advice is buy from me gold. And not just any ordinary gold, refined gold. Because, of course, God's gold would be, you know, actually, there's, there's pictures in, in Revelation of the new heavens and the new earth and the new Jerusalem that gold's so pure that it's translucent. That's amazing. Okay. And he says, buy from me gold refined by the fire. So I think, again, you know, quit resisting the testing. Quit trying to just get out of the persecution, maybe by not being so obviously people of faith. You know, let the fire achieve its purpose. Re receive from me refined fire. Uh, gold refined by fire that you may become rich what in material things of course not again that you might become spiritually rich that you might become fortified in your soul that you might have things that are of value true value and of eternal value because bold gold will burn in the judgment fires at the end as well even any in all elements and then he goes on to say, in white garments, that you could clothe yourselves. The white garments, the righteousness of Christ. The, one of the most wonderful truths in, is that what we have these like really pitiful, wretched, nasty garments because of our own sin and rebellion. That's what we have. That's all we, that's the best we can do. Jesus says, I will, you know, I will, when we place our faith in him and are born again, saved, forgiven, set for heaven, he's, the scriptures say explicitly that you become clothed with the righteousness of Christ. The white garments. That it may cover the shame of your nakedness. That it not be revealed. And I salve to anoint your eyes that you may see. You think you see clearly, but it's not good. And right there in Laodicea, there was a medical school located in the temple of Asclepius. Asclepius. 
And they produced an eye salve that people from the Middle East would use for common eye ailments. And here again, man, that's not what he's talking about. He says you need spiritual healing to see with eyes of faith, right? Because faith is seeing and, and, and not, not leading by, by physical sight, but by faith to see what is genuinely true. He's addressing the, their need. Because he, he rebukes them, but, but it goes right on to say because he loves them, right? He rebukes them because he loves them. Verse 19, those whom I love I reprove and discipline. Therefore be zealous and repent. It isn't that you are pitiful and I'm just going to come down and squash you. He tells them the truth. He doesn't hold back. He doesn't go, I'm a, I don't want to hurt their feelings. I don't want to offend them. I don't want to drive them away. You know, all these things, the lies that we hear all the time. He's straight with them because they need to hear the truth. But he's doing it, why? He's reproving or disciplining, correcting because he loves them. And he's saying you don't need to stay you know, wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. But it, heed my advice and receive from me the refined gold. Be truly rich. The, the white garments of my righteousness to be applied to you. The eye salve so you can see like I see. They have the eyes of the Father. See, the eyes of the Father are the ones that see the need around us. Our own eyes might see it. You know, we see, oh gosh, that person's in need. But the eyes of the Father says, oh, well, what are you going to do about it? To have and to see accurately. And then he comes finally, um, well, not finally, but to the, ex, ex, uh, yes, to the promise. Verse 20 to 22. And a, a rather well-known uh, passage, and particularly verse 20. Um, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and I will dine with him and he with me. He who overcomes. And he goes into that promise. But here, man, dr dramatically, Jesus pictures himself as standing outside and knocking on a door. Okay? And he says... Boldly, behold, I stand at the door and knock. So he's trying to get their attention, right? It says a lot of things. It says, I'm on the outside and let me in. And I'm trying, I'm trying to get there trying to get your attention that you might invite me in. Because look what he says. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in. Okay? Stop there for now. But I will come in. Now... This appeal is often, because I know even when I was first saved in 1980, and I was 21 years old, um, I joined a group um, of what was then called Campus Crusade for Christ, um, now called CRU, uh, on the University of Montana campus. And man, they were zealous about the gospel and about sharing the gospel. So here I was, brand new saved myself, and man, I got some older uh, wonderful mature staff members that I actually had the privilege of living with and I was discipled and I was trained in being able to share my faith. Well, I remember using this verse and, 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 and God, God will use it. it it's, it's good and true. But you know, the, this verse, he's not speaking in verse 20 to the unsaved. He's speaking to the church at Laodicea. People who are living their lives as if 
virtually as if God really doesn't exist. Now, we all would say, yes, we know. Let me, let me clarify. Living as if, you know, just ignoring the reality that God exists. And just living our lives in just our own way, our own will, our own whatever. And he is outside. Okay? And so Jesus comes to the church and to Christians and knocks on the door. Now, even though, you know, even though this, is, this passage is not teaching about somebody who doesn't know Jesus and doesn't have him on the inside, and, you know, people use this for evangelism all the time, and God has been gracious and faithful to, to use it. Because it, 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 it really does fit, particularly out of context, but, it, it, you know, and, and again, God is beautiful and wonderful and gracious to, to even add his blessing to that in our efforts in evangelism. But he is not speaking to the unsaved. He is speaking to the church. He is speaking to you and me to whatever degree we have not let him in. And particularly to the person who is generally born again, but really says, I am content. I have, don't have much need of anything. Um, you know, it all just looks good and feels good right now. And so I live virtually as if God doesn't exist, ignoring the fact that God does exist. And so he comes to that Christian and... Knocks on the door and tries to get our attention. And perhaps sometimes he must be very persistent in knocking and continuing to knock. That he might get our attention. And his appeal is for those who hear the knock to do what? To open the door, right? To go to the door, you know, to get up out of our comfortable stupor and go to the door and open it. And then the beauty begins. <laughs> Starts out, you are poor, wretched, miserable, blind, and naked. But I love you. And if you open the door, Jesus says, I will come in to you and I will dine with you and you with me. Now, the dining means, man, I mean, the fact, particularly in this context of the ancient world, when you ate with somebody, you said, we have a, a oneness. We accept one another. We, 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 we are not embarrassed of the other person. We, you know, we accept you. We, we're, we're, we're fine with being seen with you um, and, and all of that. It meant a closeness. It meant uh, that, that, that we are there, you know, hanging out together, eating together, talking together, sharing time together, sharing things with one another. And he promises to do that. He promises to do that. See, Jesus on the outside, there could be no true fellowship with God or genuine well-being of who I am. Because he's on the outside. I'm not going to have well-being, and it's going to begin to show, and I'm going to begin to feel it. But with Jesus on the inside, there's wonderful fellowship and the sharing of the marvelous grace of God and all the, the myriad, countless, beautiful things a close walk with God. I want to read for you, if you want to turn, we're going to read a passage in John chapter 15. In John chapter 15, and beginning in verse 1. I would encourage you to turn there with me. 
I'm pretty sure it is on your notes. But John 15, beginning at verse 1. I think this, this is the same author. This is John. And he had sweet fellowship with God. He was closer to Jesus than any human ever was when Jesus walked this world. And he's recording Jesus' words. These are all Jesus' words we're going to read. When he's with his disciples in a vineyard and gives this teaching. I think perhaps one of the most central and important passages of scripture uh, that we have that God has spoken. Chapter 15, verse 1. I am the true vine... And my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away, or really perhaps better, he lifts up. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes it so that it may bear more fruit. You are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. And I think he speaks about clean in verse 3 because verse 2 where it says he takes away really means that he lifts up and, and it has to do with lifting up a low branch, a low part of the vine that is, that is trailed into the dust and the dirt. And he lifts it up and he cleans it because the vine keeper knows that you don't just cut off a, 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 a branch that's there. You, you lift it up and you clean it and you put it back where it can thrive. But you're already clean because of the word I spoke to you. Verse 4, abide in me. See, there is that if you hear my voice, open the door and I'll come in. Abide in me and I in you as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine. So neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I am him, he bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. With Jesus on the outside of the door, the other side, we've got him outside of our lives. Nothing of any real good or value is going to happen. And maybe even a lot of things that haunt our soul. But when he's on the inside... Apart from me, you can do nothing. Verse 6, if anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away. So here is one who literally has. I mean, they have said no to Almighty God. He is thrown away in a branch and dries up, and they gather them, and they cast them in the fire, and they are burned. If you abide in me, and my word abides in you, that's one way we invite Jesus in. That's how we gain close fellowship, in a sense, really sit at the table and eat with him, is that we read his word. And we listen to his spirit's small voice and we pray and we interact. If you abide in me and my word abides in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. My Father is glorified by this, that you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples. It is an absolute expectation that followers of Jesus bear fruit. And if you don't, therefore, there is something seriously wrong, okay? It is a tree that's supposed to bear fruit, and it doesn't. Something's wrong. Verse 9, just as the Father has loved me, I have also loved you. Abide in my love. Let him in. Come in. Let's spend time together. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in Him. So much of the maintenance of that abiding is that we, do, that we listen. We hear what the Spirit says to the churches and we obey. Uh, we listen and we don't blow Him off. We listen and we say, yes, Lord. That is essential. It is a requirement to abiding is to hear what he has said and to do as he says. It, it's not an essential for salvation. It is an essential for fellowship. The Laodiceans were the church. They were Christians. They were saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. 
but they needed, they were outside of him. He was outside of them in abiding and in fellowship because of their own sin and rebellion and disobedience. And if you keep my command, I will, and you abide in my love, just as I've kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. Verse 11, these things I've spoken to you, get this, that my joy, my joy, Jesus says, my joy may be in you and that your joy may be made full. Now, so oftentimes we are, live in a state of being less than joyful. I have confessed to you that, that, that much of this, this artificial manner of life that we're living now for a year um, is not set well with me. And there have been periods of time where I have lost my joy. Now, is God insufficient? No. My faith in abiding has been insufficient. And I don't know, and, and yet at the same time, I know that, that we as humans go through these things. And it isn't necessarily shame on you because, you know, as the great Spurgeon exclaims how, how deep in depression he would cycle, and yet one of the most amazing men of God who ever lived. You read the Psalms of David, and he's depressed at times, and he is anxious at times, and he is struggling. We, it's real. So on one hand, I don't want to say it in such a way that you just feel like a worm because you have not thrived in joy. But at the same time, I want you to realize that, that we own it. We still do own it because God's grace is sufficient for the need of the moment. And he speaks these kind of things to us that our joy may be made full. That his joy, which is infinite and perfect, would be in me. And that's just a re remarkable at, at the onset. That, that that's what God offers. <laughs> and, and that my joy, which is infinite and perfect, may be in you so that your joy may be full. Oh, thank you, Lord. And I am so grateful that though I, you know, I cycle into periods of depression and anxiety, it is a cycle because I also cycle into those, these moments. But I do speak to you. I appeal to you as I do to my own soul. Wherever you lack joy, even in these times or in any other, he says, abide in me. He says, behold, I stand at the door and knock. And anyone who hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in. And I will have fellowship with you. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. And so he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. So are we listening? Before we pray, I want to draw your attention to the action points. Just to draw your attention to them, they're in the bulletin. I encourage you to work through that and don't dismiss any of it. Also to draw your attention to what is next week. Next week is Easter or First Fruits or Resurrection Sunday. Uh, and we will celebrate that together here. You know, a remarkable thing happened a year ago around mo most of the world, Christians did not gather in places of worship, of, 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 of together assembled community worship for one of the rare times, I'm sure, in all of history since that first Sunday morning. And yet, we'll be back. And it's a good opportunity as well to invite people, to encourage folks to come back, to spend the time uh, together. 
Uh, and also a reminder, again, of Good Friday that we'll meet here at 6.30 on Friday, uh, a Good Friday slash mini Passover, um, as well as if you wish to view uh, the teachings on YouTube on Passover, I encourage you, particularly if you had, did not participate in them last year, and you've never participated in a Passover before, you will be amazed. Uh, God has spoken so clearly uh, through his word and, th and through the event, uh, the feast <clears throat> of Passover. Uh, all right. Father in heaven, Lord God, uh, Oh, thank you, Lord, that you knock. Thank you, Lord, that you, you pursue. You come to me and you knock on my head and you say, wake up and let me in. I thank you that you promised that those who hear and open the door, you will come in and have fellowship. Lord, I thank you for your teaching in the vineyard of abiding and abiding through obedience, abiding through faith, abiding and knowing that we can do nothing in our own, that, that we must be attached uh, to the vine. Help us, Lord God, to, to live there and, and certainly more often than not. And Lord, may it be for, uh, certainly not just for my own sake, but for your sake, as I claim your name for the sake of the lost, the sake of the kingdom, for the sake of of the, each one that you love with your life, we ask in the authority that we have in the precious name of you, Yeshua, in the name of Jesus, amen. Please stand for our closing song. sworn I heard you talking Oh, maybe it was just a dream It sounded something like redemption An echo from a younger day Lord, how long have I been drifting My tears are falling as I pray Lord, wake up the sleeper I lift my head I lift my head Your search of lights found me Here at my end I'm at my end fear of falling down again Oh, that keeps me sitting here I'd rather wander in the shadows Than have to look into the mirror There's so much madness all around me They wear their darkness on their now my blinded eyes are open And I see the darkest part of me Lord, wake up the sleeper I lift my head, I lift my head Your search of lights found me Here at my
you have any final things to say? Nope. Okay. You are dismissed. Have a good week.